This week, Marie and I spoke with Roy Duncan from Hariawat University. We talked about his work using super resolution imaging. We also talked about the pros and cons of preprints. Have a listen and enjoy. So my name is Rory Duncan, and I'm a professor of, I guess, biophysics at Harriet Watt University. And I've been there for something like just almost seven years now. Before that, I spent a long time at the University of Edinburgh Medical School. And before that, I was a Wellcome Trust Fellow, and a series of Wellcome Trust Fellowships. And um, so I moved to Harriet Watt mainly because my, my particular brand of biology, if you like, was becoming much more targeted, oriented, directed by things like engineering and physical sciences. Mm -hmm. And I find it very difficult in a medical school to collaborate with those types of people. Mm -hmm. Even though there are lots of those individuals in Edinburgh, if they were in a different campus or a different building, mm -hmm. and I just find it very, very hard. They may as well have been on the other side of the Atlantic. And so I moved to Harriet Watts, and that proved to be very opportune for me for all sorts of reasons. Um, one reason was shortly after I arrived, we had a big reorganization. Uh, I joined the School of Engineering and Physical Sciences, not the School of Life Sciences. Mm. It was quite bold, I think. Um, I don't think it was bold, but my colleagues in Edinburgh thought I was nice <laughs> for doing this because I moved from a really big Russell group, very well funded, amazingly well established, equipped medical school to a tiny little university on the outskirts of the city and joined a physics department. Mm. And so it was, I think, really quite an interesting thing to do. Um, so anyway, when I arrived, we had a, there was a large scale reorganization. We turned from being what was the physics department and several other departments in our school, which is quite big, to a number of research institutes. And I was fortunate enough to be able to form a research institute, mm. which goes by the long name of the Institute of Biological Chemistry, Biophysics and Bioengineering. And it's called that because uh, really, we have all those people in the institute, but the truth is, it's called that because we couldn't agree on a name. <laughs> so it's very difficult <laughs> when you've got a bunch Long. of people from different flavours around the table yeah. to agree a name. But it turned out that the name says what we do, and the funding agencies could really clearly identify that, and so could reviewers and so on. So it was very good. And so I do all, all sorts of things to do with imaging. I'm not a very good biologist. The sort of biology that we do is not very sophisticated, we don't use transgenics or anything mm -hmm. like that. And I've long been interested much more in technology development than in biology. And so I do this dance with funding agencies where I tell the MRC and the Wellcome Trust that I'm interested in cell biology mm -hmm. for the sake of finding out about biology. Mm -hmm. And I do a dance with different funding agencies where I tell them that we can develop technology to answer the biology. Mm -hmm. That's why this was opportune. And you can only really do this if you have the properly engaged physicists, chemists, engineers, and these days more and more and more mathematicians. Yeah. And the type of work that we do generates lots and lots of data. And biologists are just simply not equipped to know what to do with the data. So and that's our biggest challenge at the moment. And so more and more of what we're doing is um, acquiring information from our samples vast volumes of information and then try to integrate different diverse data streams, if you like, in mathematical models. Mm -hmm. Then using those models to predict what would happen if we perturbed something in the biology, and then go back to the biology, perturbing it, and see what the output of the model looks like compared to the real world. And I think that's really quite powerful. It's becoming quite a powerful way to, to be. Do you focus on a specific um molecular needs, let's say. Yes. I know that you are working with membrane trafficking. Yeah, so I do membrane, I'm interested in membrane trafficking, uh, specifically exocytosis, so mm -hmm. these days we're moving into autophagy. Mm -hmm. so, I'm bit, so I'm very interested in the molecules that drive membrane fusion. And again, that kind of came from the interest of the technology and the imaging more than the biology, because imaging things like vesicles and cells moving around is great, because you can see them, they're dynamic and it's brilliant and yeah. anyone who ever sees it thinks it's brilliant yeah. and the students love it and I love yeah. it and so it's a really good thing and we can trigger exocytosis so we know when to look so that makes life easier. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a really interesting blend of interest I think between the biology the reason for studying it and the technology there so that's my focus. We have an uh, yeah, exocytosis. I also study yeah, vesicle okay. trafficking um, in, yeah. in a plant model system right. and I know um, from the imaging experience that I have, 
the vesicle trafficking is really wonderful because it's exciting. You can see yeah. stuff move around. Yeah. It's always beautiful. Yeah. Um, but the challenge is also they move in three-dimensional space. Sure. So how do you manage if you have a growing cell and yeah. you have vesicles moving in the three-dimensional kind of cube of the cell, yeah. uh, cube for plant cells, obviously. Yeah. Um, how do you maintain focus? How do you maintain depth yeah, perception really of it? And then how do you track specific vesicles mm. if you want? So it's really interesting to me from a technological perspective for mm. imaging of how to really incorporate faster lasers, faster imaging path pathways, um, software, all of that. Um, and what's the best way to do it, especially <laughs> when you're dealing with yeah. maybe flat cells versus not flat cells versus long, maybe philopodia versus a tube like a yeah. hair or a palm so you're asking me a question or is it the No, that was just that was just <laughs> kind of a rhetorical thing. Yeah. But what I, I I've always thought about um, it not so like vesicle trafficking not being a great imaging model because of all of the movable parts that you don't have any control over. I had never really yeah. thought about it from a perspective of actually being um, a real wealth of ways of looking at how yeah. to improve the technology. Yeah. That's right. So I think it is it's quite useful to have a, a tractable biological system yeah. to help you drive various sorts of technology development. And so there's there are one or two ways of doing what you said. So one is just to completely ignore the problem and only look in a very thin section of the cell and armed with the knowledge that you can't see everything and then try to infer what's happening elsewhere. Yeah. I guess that's one way. And the other way is we have lots of optical physicists working with us who like this idea of small spots Mm -hmm. moving around and if you do signal processing or engineering or physics spots are great they're a lot less complicated than <laughs> anything any other mm -hmm. structure they're mm -hmm. all the same shape and size sure. so it's the perfect biological system for them right so we, we can actually acquire pretty much a whole cell now in a snapshot mm -hmm. and we can localize positions in z if you like where musicals are down to less than 100 nanometers so it's, it is possible to do these things now Challenging, but it's possible. Yeah, yeah. Really but it's cool. a perfect system for physicists. Yeah, small yeah, ball, yeah. all the same brightness, all the same shape and size, and they move. It's perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, do you collaborate with um, uh, biologists from the human field, like medicine and so mm -hmm. on, or do you collaborate, let's say, with plant scientists? Yeah, so I don't do very much plant biology at all. Mm. Um, I suppose the reason. For that is I just don't understand it. It's sufficiently different to make it a bit scary. Um, um, so I do mainly human biology and have a lot of MRC funding, a lot of collaborators from that side. Um, however, that said, I did have, for the last four years, she's been finished for a year, but four years, I had a plant biologist PhD student who was supervised by a botanist. And she was looking at musical trafficking in plant cells and it was interesting just to see the various challenges just associated with a small niche area of imaging yeah. and blood cells, mm. like chlorophyll, yeah. for example, yeah, yeah, yeah. chloroplasts, yeah. Yeah. bright yeah. things, yeah. Yeah. really yeah. bright also yeah. fluorescent. So. Things yeah. that also move and are of the same colour as your blobs. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. and just, uh, there, there are lots of other challenges, like the, the cell membrane, the plasma membrane, things so close to the cell wall, yeah. how, how do yeah. you know which is which, yeah. can you resolve this? There are lots and lots of challenges, and I think actually it's a really rich area for mm -hmm. people like you maybe to try to get into to mm -hmm. develop new sorts of technologies. Most of the technologies are there, they just haven't been applied, applied. yet, yep. so it's a yeah. really nice time to be in a field. I think that one of the things that's starting to be applied more and more are the um, optogenetics and yes. optobiology, so being yeah. able to switch the floor floor signals from one place to another so that you can when something gets to the plasma membrane or when it starts coming back. And I, I find that very fascinating. I think yes. that that's going to be, once it really starts getting optimized, and I know the papers look beautiful, but trying to apply it in your own hands yeah, is sometimes really a different yeah. a different story. Um, I've messed around a little bit with that, but, but it is tricky just mm -hmm. generally. And then, of course, you're dealing with shooting high-powered lasers at living things, yeah. which is good, but also not the best conditions always. Yeah. So yeah, it's very interesting. I, I was interested in what you were saying about um, changing kind of career paths a little bit from the biomedical department 
moving to a more engineering and physical based department. What was the what was the thing that helped you think that that was a good idea to do for 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 your career? So I thinking about you know diversifying or thinking about going from a postdoc maybe in one specific area and then maybe applying for a faculty position in a okay. different department and saying well how would I take my biological background and translate it to I think at some point you have to focus so at choosing when to diversify your career is probably tricky it's a tricky yeah. question so I did it a bit later so I'd already had some fellowships I had a faculty position if you like mm -hmm. which I elected to leave and then take another faculty position in a different area um, that's not to say that I was choosing to turn myself from being a biologist into a physicist or a mathematician or an engineer. So I can't do that. I don't yeah. have the background. I've never been able to do that. The thing that made me want to do it was, I think, as I said, it's um, my work was becoming more and more biophysical in the Berkeley mm. Commons. Um, and so if I speak to physicists, I tell them I'm a biologist. And I speak to biologists, I tell them I'm a biophysicist kind of gets me out of trouble sometimes. Um, <laughs> but really what it was all about was the data. So I knew that we were generating more and more and more data. And I can tell you exactly what, what I saw as a really big opportunity. So we were starting to generate very large data sets where we were able to visualize really large groups of molecules diffusing in membranes of cells, living cells at 37 degrees. And there were no commercial software packages available to track those molecules or quantify the data and there are lots of freewares around but the problem with freewares is that you don't know that it works you have to troubleshoot it yourself it's unreliable so then um, i was invited to give a seminar in the physics department at eric Watt, and i showed these data so you can imagine what they look like they're little spots and they're moving around lots of them moving really sometimes quite fast in a very crowded environment and really noisy data really really noisy because mm. you have to do image quickly and the camera is noisy and someone in the audience there were quite a few people in the audience who uh, either from mathematics or electrical engineering or physics who really find their research interests and their funding their career in writing algorithms for tracking noisy data <laughs> that's what they do perfect and so <laughs> perfect. And the reason they do that is for example the really nice one is that NASA run annual competitions for mathematicians to work out what the best tracking algorithms are. Oh, right. And the reason they're doing that is because NASA use land-based telescopes to track space debris. So yeah. there's a lot of stuff in orbit and NASA are waiting for it to crash into itself and plummet to Earth and kill us all. <laughs> so really they want to be able to track as much of this as possible and the data are exactly similar or very similar to the data that we produce from our microscopes. So all of a sudden, we had the world's best tracking algorithms. Mm -hmm. And this, so that actually is pretty much what made me decide to uproot my career and move there. And you know, in the last few years, we've published maybe, I don't know, 10 papers or something using these sorts of technologies. Amazing. And we've ended up, we were a really small university at Harry Potter, and physics is a small part mm -hmm. of a small university. Mm -hmm. And we've ended up being really at the forefront of the world of being able to do this. And so it's just a, a serendipitous yeah. meeting with some people from another area who were immediately able to say, I can do that. Mm -hmm. Kind of seeing a different part of your data that you weren't able to identify yourself. Yeah. yeah, and do things that I wasn't able to do. And so I say this all the time when people ask me these questions. So there are questions in the data that we didn't know existed. So it's not mm. even just looking for answers in your data. It's yeah, questions yeah, in your yeah, data. Sure. So it is really interesting the way that a mathematician thinks about the information compared to the way a biologist thinks about mm -hmm. it. And how do you incorporate postgraduate and undergraduate experiences into, into so, all of this work? Yeah, so we've worked really hard on this in the institute. So we're a brand new institute, um, very multidisciplinary. Um, Right now, there's something like 150 people in the institute, and 20% to 25% are biologists. Mm -hmm. There's everybody there. And so it's quite challenging to do this, and I felt really quite strongly that it was important for people to speak to one another. Mm -hmm. And you very commonly hear people say the challenge of working across disciplines is one of language. But it's not. It's one of culture. Mm -hmm. So I can give you a very good example in a minute about what that means. So we. We had a new building, 
and when I was involved at the stage of designing that building, <laughs> I did something that wasn't very popular at the time, which was to specify a room for the postgraduates and the students, which looks a bit like a call centre. <laughs> <laughs> this is what they call it. It's yeah. gigantic. It's a really big open plan room. And we did that for reasons of cost, obviously, but we also did it for reasons of mixing everybody up. That's nice. And yeah. we found that the way to bring the academic groups together was to bring the students and the postdocs together. Because they spoke to one another, they mm -hmm. realised, oh, there's a guy on the other side of the room who can track single molecules. Yeah. Bring them together, brings the academics together, there's some projects there. And that is how it worked. The cultural difference is really important. So, as a biologist, the work, we just published a paper this year that took seven years to get to fruition, come to fruition. So we'd, we'd observed something, it didn't agree with the published literature, mm. we couldn't publish it, we didn't want to publish it because we didn't know why. We worked with some maths guys and then we worked out and now we published something which we think is correct, may or may not be correct. But um, that proved to be very frustrating for the mathematicians. So <laughs> a, a biologist like me, hold on to the data in secret, which is not healthy for science. In secret, we protect it really yeah. carefully. We don't tell yeah. anybody about it, we don't put it on posters, we don't tell anybody, until we've got a story that we think we can publish in the highest impact journal we can get it into. Mm. And you can judge for yourselves if you think that's good for humanity or not. Yeah. Biologist, uh, sorry, a mathematician, on the other hand, will write an algorithm, prepare an algorithm, test it, and then publish it in something called the archive. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know, you know what the archive yeah, is. Pre -print. Yeah, preprint. So it yeah. goes out in a preprint, it's public, it has a DOI, so mm -hmm. they own it and they're happy yeah. with that. And then other mathematicians can start chipping in and testing it and improving it and iterating like that. And so what our maths colleagues wanted to do was at every stage publish bits of the algorithms they were writing. And I was very resistant to this. And so it proved to be very frustrating. And I can tell you, for a mathematician, Having a paper in, for example, the journal Cell doesn't help their career. Yeah, right. For a biologist, a cell biologist, it's transformational mm -hmm. for your career. So the cultural difference is there. Of course, what's happening now in life science is we're all waking up rather late to this, and so it's bioarchive, and um, a number of the really big funding agencies, particularly the Wellcome Trust, are becoming increasingly frustrated with the behaviour of publishers, yeah. publishing houses. Yeah. So they're trying to encourage people to be much more open access and so on. And so I think things are slowly changing, but the big challenge is one of culture. Yeah, we talk about this a lot actually. I'm also interested in science, science writing and communication in general, uh, hence podcast. Um, but we, always, we oftentimes talk about, uh, in our lab meetings and things, about the influx in open source publishing, yeah. like, you know, just totally online, open yes. access, everything. Preprints, we talked about a paper that was for um, looking at plant root growth, uh, where they just took a confocal microscope and turned it around so that they could look <coughs> at everything going in uh, the direction of gravity. Mm -hmm. And that was preprint. I think mm -hmm. we all saw it on Twitter. Yeah. And yeah. Um, we have a lot of conversations about, um, you know, if you do preprints, it's not peer review. Does peer review even need to happen? What kind of peer review needs to yeah. happen if everything's going to be open access? Yeah. How is it helping our community as scientists in terms yeah. of information resource and sharing? And if we say that science is about education and communication and progressing the practice of science what are we doing yes. holding on to all of these all of this data that we end up either never publishing or publishing seven years later and exactly you know and keeping it secret and keeping it duration. secret yeah yeah it's very unhealthy so I'm, I'm very interested in science communication i do a lot of public engagement work hmm. and i do that for these sorts of reasons mm -hmm. i do it mainly because it's, it's good fun and but i think it's very important to tell publics about science yeah. Yeah. for all sorts of reasons yeah. that we probably don't have time to go into. And I, I agree completely. I think one of the issues, not necessarily the peer review, but with scientific publication in general, is that it's aimed at a tiny audience. So you're, you're taking either charity money or taxpayers' money, money, lots of mm -hmm. it, and you're doing some work with it to the best of your abilities, and then after seven years, your output is an article, which if you're an academic, 
you're doing really well if you get 100 citations yeah. on average. You know, really, really well. So 100 people in the world have read it and cited your work. But the public can't understand it because it's written in technical language. So there was a study um, recently done in the world of all things to do with science communication that said that the ability of individuals to understand abstracts had decreased, and scientists to understand abstracts had decreased, mm. because the use of jargon and technical language has increased. And that's really bad. Yeah. And, yeah. and so the science community is getting worse at communicating, even to itself, yeah. and is not properly articulating the importance of science to the wider society, if you like. And this you can, you, know, you probably don't want to open this kind of words in the podcast, <laughs> yeah. but this you can clearly see at the moment in the public's mistrust of experts. Yeah, sure. And yeah. that's a really big problem. And it's partly science's fault and partly academia's fault, it's partly deliberately encouraged by our leadership at the moment. But it's, I feel very strongly that it's the role of academics to stand up yeah. and properly communicate what is the role of an expert here. Yeah. And what's the role of our science and why is it valuable and why is it worthwhile having a science budget? Mm -hmm. yeah. I see a kind of self-perpetuating machine though in having to have high impact research that gets into high impact journals that are incredibly specialized that need to be applied or whatever that fo focus back on how you get your funding. And we started it's like a talking. Vicious circle, yeah, yeah, and we start. We started talking about um, how you need to tell your grant providers that you're doing something specific that you may or may not ever actually com complete do. or do, <laughs> yeah. for that matter. And we all kind of understand that we need to use money in a little more of a gray way than mm -hmm. I think. Flexible way. Yes. Yeah. Than than the than the grants want you to do, but if the grants are requiring preliminary research, how do you do that research without funding? How do you get funding for that? And then you can't do that if you're putting it on non-peer-reviewed, low-impact well, factor changing. stuff. So in, in the world of mathematics, it's already accepted. That's yeah. the culture. It's changing in biology for sure. So we, we, we published this year our first preprint in the bio archive mm -hmm. and for me I've, I've got a job so it wasn't scary for me for yeah. the postdoc who doesn't have a job she's quite nervous about this mm -hmm. because her mm -hmm. work is for many years her work is out there it was already submitted to a journal we had permission from cell press to make it a preprint and then it got rejected so now we're back to square one it might take a year for this to get yeah. peer reviewed and accepted and published nonetheless that said there is a DOI for that article it's mm -hmm. ours people should cite it you can never make a scientist cite your work anyway commonly people play games and they don't cite stuff yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, can't yeah, understand yeah. the entire yeah. field they're not experts and so on. so i think that's less worrying and it, the world is changing and funding agencies are really encouraging us now to use preprint and the reason that we chose to do it was because i was writing a funding proposal for the mrc and it's easier to write the proposal with something to cite, even though it had not been peer yeah, reviewed. So, sure. And yeah. I think that's healthy. So the world is changing yeah. somewhat. I think for, for, as you said, I mean, your postdoc was nervous because she doesn't necessarily have her footing yes, yet very strongly right. in it. And certainly I think that we kind of feel the same way. It's, yeah. you know, if we, if we say, um, I believe that this is the important direction that we need to go through and I'm going to support that, how does that necessarily affect my ability to get into a position to actually make that true. I think, because in, in other words, it's, it's not very easy for students or for young researchers who don't have like the pedigree yet or the clout to be able to stand behind those convictions successfully. Yes. Because you're still working within the system that doesn't totally accept it yet. So it's hard to feel like you can make a change without, and then you think, oh, I'll just make a change from the inside. But once you get inside, it's really difficult to make yeah. those changes too. Um, you're, and you, you now have, have created this, you've trained yourself to work within the broken system. So if it's working for you, you know, maybe. It's a very depressing way of looking at it. It's intimidating, I find, as someone kind of looking from outside into it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the system's not broken. Personally, I don't think it's broken. That's good. I think the system could be improved. Mm. So it's not mm. broken, but mm. it's, it mm. needs improvement for 
for sure. Um, and I think, particularly in biology, our culture is, the thing we really look at is the impact factor of the journal. So if you question where the impact factor of journals come from, the impact factors are generated by commercial organisations yeah. who in turn are either beholden or the same individual, the same organisations as the publishers. So that's obviously going to be corrupt. Yeah. And publishing is very profitable. That's also, perhaps the word isn't corrupt, that's too strong, but they, they have a self-interest in this. And so anything we can do to work alongside that, so perhaps using preprint is mm -hmm. one solution, or just doing some self-publishing, like say on Twitter or social mm -hmm. media of any description, anything you can do to work alongside that, what we probably agree is not quite busted, but a system that needs improved, is healthy. And I understand what you mean about it's difficult to change something once you're in the system. Yeah. We have no option. So I think in many ways, so one thing I've learned over the years, I'm a very impatient person and I always want to change everything all at once mm -hmm. and um, if you can't, if something's really out of your remit or your control and you can't change it, don't get stressed about it. It's easier said than done. Yeah, of course. But there are things you could do. So self-publishing I think is very attractive mm -hmm. and the you know, Welcome Trust have, we've just again published a public engagement paper on Welcome Open Science. And they have a really interesting model, so it has to be welcome funded at the moment, so we had a, a, a grant specifically for public engagement from Welcome Trust, we wrote up our activities as a paper, and had some proper science in it, submitted it to Welcome Open Science, they then scrutinise it, make sure it meets the standards and so on, and it goes straight online without peer review, a bit like a preprint, mm -hmm. but then they peer review it, so they send it out to a bunch of peers, and it gets peer reviewed in public. So I'm just waiting to see oh. how this will work for us. Mm -hmm. And if you look on their website, it's very successful. They've published hundreds of papers so far in the last few months. Some of them look like really good, solid, substantial science papers. Um, if you look on their website, there's a very extensive list of frequently asked questions from nervous scientists. And <laughs> some of them say things like, well, what happens if this goes online and the three referees hate it and say some really intemperate things about my work. And that's not uncommon in the secret world of peer review. Yeah. Yeah. And the Welcome Trust response is, it's kind of hands in the air and a bit of a shrug. Um, what's the worst that can happen is one answer. But really what they're saying is mainly is, this is all in public. The public know who you are because you can see who the authors are. They can read the work and they also know who the reviewers, reviewers. are. Yeah. And Every letter which is typed by those reviewers yeah. is made public instantly. Your response is instant and it goes yeah. round so and it's, round it's transparent. Like this. So yeah. it's totally yeah. transparent. And I think that actually yeah. is quite yeah. a good idea. Yeah. yeah, we've we've also we've also had these conversations of, you know, do, do you keep what's the what are the benefits and the strengths of anonymous reviewership and what are the benefits and strengths of of not having anonymous Reviewership, and I guess for me, I always it's a big debate. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, I think that like on the one hand, right, everyone says, well, if you're anonymous, it means that you can be more open with what you have to say, and your ranking doesn't necessarily have to harm your <coughs> critique of someone's work, and that person, if they don't like what you say, won't go after you. And my attitude is always, well, shouldn't we always be saying things that we can back up, that we would feel comfortable saying in yes. front of anybody? And two, aren't we scientists who are supposed to be objective thinkers and why would we take anything out on someone when really we're supposed to be helping? <laughs> but yeah. I think, I mean, the review process, and this is, at least this is how I try to think of it, it's just a, pro it's, it's part of the conversation. And if I'm a reviewer, my job is to help that person communicate their work the best that they possibly yes, can. So I'm not going to say like, all of this is garbage. I can't even believe you sent it to review. You know, you're going to say... I think that's very rare. I mean, you, you often read these sorts of tales on social media, for example. You know, there's, a, there's even a social media account called Shit Reviewers Say. <laughs> and people paste in really intemperate, stupid ah, comments. Ah, yes, I've yeah. seen that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And it's got yeah. thousands yeah. and thousands and thousands of followers. And it's a joke. But it's not a joke if you're on the receiving end of that. Of course. Yeah, yeah. But it's actually quite rare. I think it's rare for reviewers to really be intemperate and go off on Mm -hmm. But it's not rare for people to feel really hurt and crushed and lack resilience that day mm -hmm. because they've had something rejected and mm -hmm. in a way that they feel 
is not fair. You, you always, almost always, if you have something rejected, feel it's not fair, and you go through the various stages of grief. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's yeah, there's totally. something there's uh, denial, and, you know, all these various stages. And yeah. yesterday I had an email from RCUK rejecting a grant, mm. and it was very highly reviewed. Uh, you know, there are there are scores, numerical mm -hmm. scores, the highest I've ever had for that funding agency. And it still got rejected. And I'm in the middle of this denial phase where yeah. every time my phone bombs and there's an email, I think it might be a mistake. Yeah, mistake. There's someone from RCUK going to write and say, sorry, you can we have We sent you the wrong email. Oh, email. This was yeah. intended for somebody who got worse from you. <laughs> but in the end, um, when I go back to it, you know, I'll allow the dust to settle and I go back to it. I can see that there are flaws in the work and it could be improved. And it's pretty much, it's always, it's almost always the same with peer review. One of the challenges comes, it's almost because of the world of social media now, that very often you get quite short reviews, and there's a short space for the reviews, mm -hmm. and so the reviewers don't have time to articulate exactly what they mean, mm -hmm. and so you take that personally, and yeah. then you might think they're stupid or, or wrong. So I think it is unusual for reviews to be completely off the mark, it's not. It's unusual, but it happens. Um, but generally, they are meant in good faith. Mm -hmm. Generally, I think whether or not we should change the system and have it less anonymized, there's certainly yeah. quite a lot of discussion to be had there. Yeah, yeah. I think though, as we move towards a more online life, yes, it's, it's probably going to get change. really hard to keep it. It's going to change. Totally I mean, we've only really had impact factors for 20 years or 25 years mm -hmm. or something like that. I'd mm -hmm. never heard of it when I was doing a PhD, and it, mm -hmm. they've really become mm -hmm. very, very important. Yeah. And that's, to be honest, you have to be careful what you wish for. So biologists, yeah. <laughs> we send our work to the best journal we can think it will take it. Um, what's happened in those journals is they're vastly oversubscribed, so they have the dreaded editorial stage which is really opaque, mm -hmm. and so the editor will just return it commonly and say, I don't think it's interesting to try no, a more specialized yeah, yeah. journal. That's not scientific. You know, that, so we, that, if we stopped sending our work there, yeah. if we had the nerve to do this, that would cease. But we don't, because yeah. it can really, like I said earlier, be transformational for your career, yeah. particularly early in your career, mm -hmm. if you get mm -hmm. paper into nature. Yeah, settled, yeah. kind of. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Almost. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> you were talking about the different cultures between biologists and physicists and, yeah. and mathematicians, and that actually um, the way that maybe we want to start quantifying biology, we could really, as biologists, use the help of mathematicians and physical scientists. How can we, um, like for for us, maybe as examples, how would how can we help start cultivating or thinking about how to start cultivating those relationships? Yeah, this is a really golden question. The, 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 the problem is not finding a mathematician to speak to because you're in a big university. Mm -hmm. A university is just a gathering of academics. You could go to the maths department and you could find some people to chat to. And some of those individuals, you could have lunch with them and they would be really interested in what you've got. And you know they might want to help. The challenge really is getting people to devote what is a large part of their time and so their career and their future to working at the interface with your work and mm -hmm. what's in it for them. That is a really hard bit. And so, you know, I'm currently speaking to a number of fund funders about this at the moment and what things could we do. And so I'm in the middle of writing a large network proposal to try to bring these people mm -hmm. together. And the challenges in the middle, so I can clearly see what we hope the outputs would be, but in the middle of these individuals, how do we persuade them to do it? Yeah. It's not so hard from, if you like, I don't like this language, but our side, if you mm -hmm. like, of biologists, because mm -hmm. there's so many biologists. And we can clearly see what the benefits would be. So if you have some mathematical modelling in your paper and you find something out, you get it into this dreaded high impact journal, it's going to be really good for you. The mathematician doesn't care about self. So how, how can we persuade those people to stop studying what they're doing, because yeah. you can't do everything, mm -hmm. and study what we're doing using the same tools? Or even harder, how can you persuade those maths guys to stop leaving after their PhD and working for a pension fund, Finance. or working mm -hmm. for a hedge fund, yeah. and stay in R&D? Yeah. That's a really tough nut to crack, because mm -hmm. they can yeah. earn so much more money. 
and it comes down to individuals. So I think in the end, um, you, ha you have to seek out interested individuals who are doing this for themselves, and they're not doing it necessarily for salary or, or anything else. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you for spending thank the you time. So much. My pleasure. Yeah. Nice. We'll look forward to hearing your talk later yes. this yeah, afternoon. Good. Okay. okay. Yeah, excellent. You can follow Duncan at HWU underscore Duncan Lab. You can follow Maria at M underscore Papanatsu. And you can follow me at ER Larson underscore PhD. Join us next time.